Ah! Nearly forgot. <laughs> Honestly, I did. I nearly forgot. Not at all. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Hope everybody's keeping well. <laughs> Deep breath. Welcome to Book Talk. Mythical Ireland Book Talk. A little bit like Live Irish Myths, except we're not entirely focused on mythology. Tonight's episode, funnily enough, is largely focused on mythology. Hope you're all safe and well. The news yesterday here was that we're going into further restrictions. We're, al we're already in a lockdown of sorts, and uh, we're going to be further restricted now. Um, there's nobody else from other households allowed in your household except for our uh, for crucial uh, business, which includes tradesmen and uh, tradespeople, should I say, and those who absolutely need to be in your house. Um, so anyway, the case numbers today in Ireland are the highest they have ever been in a single day. So um, unfortunately, uh, things definitely, definitely not going in the right direction. Anyway, let's distract ourselves with a little bit of chat and mythology and book and library talk and you know let's see what happens um i should say that helen guinan is the first of the commenters tonight on facebook your majesty are my prostrations deep enough mom long enough and deep enough a very good evening mom I'll read the Facebook tonight first because they tend to be the busier ones. Mark Munoz says, this two times, Mr. Murphy being funny. Love it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to find new places to hide. <laughs> Barbara Barney says, hi, Anthony, and hi, everyone. Hello, Bar Barbara. Rowan Grove is in the house. Greetings from Colorado. Well, greetings from Drogheda in the Boyne Valley. <clears throat> Janet Cassidy says, is that the same in Northern Ireland also? I'm not exactly sure. They're definitely in severe restrictions too. I'm not exactly sure what they're doing versus us. Anne McCallum is in the house. Sorry to hear about the further restrictions. Look, I'm lucky. I'm working from home since the beginning of March. I'm working right here. And my Mythical Ireland work is right here too. So I'm okay. You know, I'm hoping everybody else is okay. Rowan Grove says she's bowing. Yes. We'll have to start, we'll have to start, you know, getting people to share videos and pictures of their bowing to make sure it's happening properly to Her Majesty's high standards. Peter Kennedy says, greetings from the Drogheda train. Hello, Peter, on his way to Drogheda from Balbriggan or the opposite way around. Uh, Les Macon Ulti says, Fascoa An Anthony from the Isle of Lewis. Now, Insha Gall in Alba. Fantastic stuff. Hello, Les. Helen says, quite apt. Well, thank you, Your Majesty, Your Royal, Your Royal Highness. Jerry Andrades says, hello, Anthony, from Wirral. Good evening to you, Jerry. Nice to see you. Thanks for dropping in. Sharon Donnellan Phillips is in Nevada and says, greetings, hello, to all the Nevadan, Nevadians. Nevadans. Uh, Manon Frenzen Borsboom, I hope I've pronounced that right, says, greetings from Holland. Hello, Manon, Folge. Welcome along. Edina Sparks, uh, one of the regulars, says, afternoon, Anthony and all. And the non-regulars are, of course, very welcome. Caitlin Moon says, hello, everyone. From Dublin, strange days here. Yeah, I've only been in my office, at my office in Dublin once at my desk uh, in 6 March, March, March to October. It's actually seven months, and that was to clear out my desk. So there you go, Caitlin. Uh, definitely strange days. Leanne Shrum, Shrum says, love your show. Thanks, Leanne. Great to see you along. Welcome. Make yourself comfortable. Jackie McCusco Hornsey says, Good evening. Turn on a watch, Jackie. Slauncha. Shannon Allen says, Hello from Alberta, Canada. Numbers are up in this part of the world, too. Yeah, I think they're going up in quite a lot of places. Jerry Andrade's, We are shut down here on the Merseyside, but keeping strong. Well, brilliant. Good to hear it. Jackie says, Faskarwa Anthony Augustua na Hinver, Inver Nish. Is it Nish or Nish in Alba? Brilliant stuff. Thanks, Jackie. Donna Moyers says, stay well and may your restriction bring peace and insight. Yeah, well, do you know what? It hasn't been too bad from the point of view that the whole Live Irish Mits stream uh, stemmed from the whole from the whole COVID-19 situation. So silver linings and all that, you know. What is it the say the saying it's an ill wind that doesn't blow good for someone or something like that? So we we'll we, we keep that. 
Rowan says, I am also fortunate I'm retired and can stay in my house except for long morning walks and occasional grocery runs. Patricia McAteer is in the house. Hi, Patricia, in the north of the county. To Balbriggan from Dublin after a busy day in work, says Peter, with a yawn. Oh, I hope I don't put you to sleep for the rest of it. <laughs> don't just don't miss, don't miss the Balbriggan stop. Don't end up in, uh, I was going to say Mosny, because it's just the train, it's a long time since the train stopped at Mosny, if I'm not mistaken, or do they? Uh, Gormanston, Laytown. Don't end up in Laytown. Worst places you could end up. I'm not saying nothing bad about Laytown. <laughs> On YouTube, Deborah Williams was the first of the commenters tonight. Says, hi, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Hello, Deborah. Mandy McCurl says, hello, everyone. and hope you're staying well. Beautiful day here in the Hebrides. I'm, I'm going outside to stargaze tonight with a flask of hot chocolate and a head full of stories. Doesn't that just sound fantastic? Watch out for Mars, that bright red star, which is really a planet. Low in the east at the beginning of the night, but higher in the southeast and, and the south as the night goes on. And also Jupiter and Saturn close together in the southwest, low in the southwest. Uh, who else is there? The Full Irish GK Tononoa. Good evening, all. I was just reading a book on Brehan Laws by Joe Kerrigan. It's very interesting, but the old mince pies are hurting. I'll grab a cup and listen quietly. Joe Kerrigan. I'm not sure I have that book. So there you go. There's another one I'll have to add to the library. Thanks. The Full Irish GK. GK. It's only 3 p.m. in Maryland, says Deborah. So I can't see anything yet. That's okay. <laughs> Stephen Walker says, hey, everyone. Yes, we're headed to wave two. Yeah, it's looking that way, isn't it? <sighs> Fingers crossed, anyway. Daisy Peters is in the house. Hi, my dears. Two of the Mythflix and Anthony. Sorry I'm late today, but I'm glad to be here. This is a no brown zone. No need to apologize, Daisy. And it's wonderful, as always, to see you along. To see you in the house. And catching up on the rest. Um, Nick Eska Casterton is in the house. Hello, Nick. Fault you. Federica Guy says, hi, Anthony. Hi, everyone. Sorry to hear that the situation is getting worse. Yes, indeed. But we live in hope, you know. Daniel Gorham says, hello from Melbourne, Australia in lockdown. Hello, Danielle. Good morning to you. And thanks for joining us. Brilliant. Wonderful to see you. Mariana Dunn says, hello, Anthony. Fault you. <clears throat> I think Laytown is the closest to Mosny. The train goes now, now, says Peter. Well, there you go. I didn't know. You see, I just, I knew it stopped there years ago. Now, um, I have to mention briefly uh, before we kind of get stuck in, this won't be a long episode, I don't think, but you know the way it happens. I say it won't be long and I'm planning for 15 or 20 minutes and after an hour and suddenly looking at the watch going, how the, where the hell did that time go to? Um, uh, Marianne Dunn Kinja, wasn't it, won the book from Monday's, was that Monday's book? No, sorry, Tuesday's book talk uh, live stream. Uh, was about um, how the Irish saved civilization. So, uh, Marianne Dunn Kindia, if you are about, uh, your your book is here. And if you get in touch by email or private Facebook message uh, with your postal address, I will post you out your uh, your copy, your prize. Uh, so, thanks for that. As always, the briefest of mentions. Uh, for patrons, thank you to all the Mythical Ireland patrons who support everything that happens here. And if you want to become a patron, uh, do look us up on patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. And I will paste that in as a link beneath the video, but the video hasn't appeared on my Facebook here, so I can't paste it in. Ah, now I can. Right. Now, don't forget, there's a lot of books in the library here, and there's probably a lot more to come over to, over time. Uh, so we've plenty of book talks to do. Um, we've done 120 episodes on live Irish myths, and there, I reckon there's still, I reckon there's, 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 we could probably go to 200 episodes of live Irish myths. I, I reckon there's enough material to take us at least another 80 episodes. So we'll keep that going once a week. Um, but the book talks, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping not to kind of get stuck into an absolute guaranteed routine of being at the computer every night at the same time as I was during the lockdown for the 102 episodes that we did back to back day after day. Um, so I'll do these, maybe I'll do a couple of these a week. Sounds like a good idea. Um, and I know that people appreciate just, uh, it's not, 
just an opportunity to listen to somebody. It's an opportunity to bring people together. It's lovely. There's a lovely sort of really community aspect to this whole thing, which is why we call the Mythical Ireland Live Irish Myths uh, family, as it were, the Tua, because that's what it is. The Tua is the tribe or the family. Pardon me. The old dinner is still repeating on me. Forgive me. Anyway, by coincidence, so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about a book that I uh, think contains uh, gold, uh, treasures, uh, a beautiful book, uh, a scholarly book, but a scholarly book that actually has both a scholarly and a popular following, um, which is unusual, actually. Um, so if you think of stuff that's on the shelf behind me, another book that would sort of cross the boundaries of both is the book about Newgrange and the excavations, Newgrange, Archaeology, Art and Legend by Michael J. O'Kelly, who is the excavator, uh, the archaeologist. It is a scholarly work, but at the same time, uh, it appeals to a popular audience. Now, first of all, I want to tell you that by the most extreme coincidence, I didn't plan it this way, but I actually picked up a copy of this book this day two years ago. It uh, was the first time I actually had a chance uh, to read this book. Having seen it in the bibliographies and in the references and footnotes of several other academic works and papers, I kept seeing this Reese and Reese Celtic heritage and I said, hmm, there's one I have to get. And you know what? I was very, very happy I got it. Now, at some time last year, I picked up a second copy of it and I gave that away in a competition. I can't remember who won that. If you're watching, maybe you let us know and maybe you let us know your opinion of the book, uh, more importantly. Uh, this is, this is a, 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 well, some would say a generation ago. Uh, this is published originally 1961, which is the year before Michael O'Kelly began his excavations at Newgrange. And of course, the same uh, year, uh, 1962, was the year when George Ogan uh, began the excavations at Nouth. And they were to go on for a lot longer than the Newgrange ones. Professor O'Kelly died in the early 1980s, unfortunately. George Ogan, Professor Ogan, is still alive at the at the uh, grand old age of 90. Uh, and we wish him well. Uh, if you've been following the main Mythical Ireland Facebook page in the past few days, you'll have noticed that we were doing a bit of a, a Nouth spree, as it were, revealing lots of, especially photographs, uh, but information too pertaining to the excavations and the monument. Burr Whelan is in the house and says, hi, Anthony, and hi, everyone. Hello, Burr, good evening. Donna Jean Porter says, hi, Volche, Slaunche. Uh, Rowan Grove said, says, I've had that one since the mid-1970s and have used it for references in some coursework. There you go, brilliant. Nola Snyder says, yay, 80 more episodes, a blessing they are. <laughs> Rowan says, book talks can be unscheduled. Yes, absolutely. We don't have to pre-announce them. Uh, Janet Cassidy says, it's excellent. I have used it for reference also. Um, so where does it fit in? Uh, it, I'll, just, why, I'll just let Coda. Coda, why don't you just come in and take it? Now you, do, you want to, do you want to sit in the chair? Go on. Coda has declined the invitation to sit in the chair, but he wants to talk over me anyway. <laughs> so I'll just shut up and let him do his thing. Take it away. And all of a sudden he doesn't want to say anything. Oh, dogs. <laughs> Kristen Gray Taggart is in the house and waving at everyone. <laughs> yes, Coda. Oh, Coda. He's mad. He's nuts. There's no other... There's no other way to explain it. He's nuts. Anyway, I'll read from the back cover of the book. Usually a good place to start. And given that this is a 1989 reprint by Thames and Hudson, uh, there are some reviews in it which are which are interesting. Anyway, this is this is a, a summary of Celtic Heritage by Alwyn and Brinley Rees. In this widely acclaimed study, Alwyn and Brinley Rees reinterpret Celtic tradition in the light of advances made in the comparative study of religion, mythology, and anthropology. 
Part one considers the distinguishing features of various cycles of tales and the personages who figure most prominently in them. Part two reveals the cosmological framework within which the action of the tales takes place. Part three consists of a discussion of the themes of certain classes of stories which tell of conceptions and births, supernatural adventures, courtships and marriages, violent deaths and voyages to the other world, and an attempt is made to understand their religious function and to glimpse their transcendent meaning. I love that word, transcendent. It's a word uh, Joseph, Joseph Campbell used quite a lot in his work, transcendent. Make yourself transparent to, to the transcendent. <laughs> Nancy Sterling says, hello all from Vermont. Good evening, Nancy Falche. Deborah Allan says, hi from Sussex in Wisconsin in the USA. Deborah, it's great to see you. Rowan says, dogs are almost as contrary as cats. I have three cats. <laughs> we have two dogs and their personalities couldn't be any different. Uh, Coda is a, a young male who is full of energy and barks a lot. And Saskia is uh, almost nine and she is uh, a Siberian husky. And she's very, very reserved and quiet. And you wouldn't even know she was in the house. She's a lovely dog. Not saying Coda isn't a nice dog, but if, I, if any of you want to take him. <laughs> joke, joke. <laughs> uh, Caitlin Moon, could we do on Kim McCone's Pagan Past, Christian Present? Save me from a few readings this semester. Yes, indeed. Great suggestion, Caitlin. Thank you for that. We should take a note of that, shouldn't I? Edina says, I agree. I have both. Paul Garron is in the house, says, hello, fellow bookworms. Uh, let me actually, let me open up a new Word document here. Okay, so uh, book talk suggested episodes. This feels familiar, doesn't it? Um, Kim McCone, Pagan Past, Christian Present. And the suggestion is from Caitlin Moon. That is a most beautiful name, by the way, Caitlin Moon. Really, really nice name. Okay. And I'll save that. No point in just putting it into a document. Uh, where do I save that now? Uh, forgive me for a moment. Sorry, I'm getting thoroughly distracted here. Janet Cassidy is uh, putting up a dog symbol. Um, what happens at this time of the year, of course, is they're letting off fireworks. I mean, they've been letting them off for weeks. Halloween isn't until the end of the month. Uh, and um, they let off fireworks and all the dogs in the vicinity start barking and Coda just reacts, you know. He he can hear them barking from inside the house. He can hear them outside and he just joins in. He just thinks it's important that he makes his voice heard in the choir, you know. You know, he didn't realize choir practice was on. Who no, Nobody told me, you know. So he just suddenly, sometimes I told you, sometimes he's lying and he's asleep on the floor of the kitchen and he hears a dog barking and he's and he's asleep. You think he's asleep and next minute, roo, roo. he just gives us a slight little bark in his sleep. It's very funny. <sighs> did it, did it, did it, yes, right. Book talk, suggested episodes. Good, right. Thanks for that. Laura Puentes in the house says, greetings. Hello, Laura. Dominic O'Fionagoyne says, do you think paganism is making a return in Ireland? I absolutely do. Uh, and it comes in all colours and flavours and varieties. Um, yeah, it definitely is. I can say that without any hesitation. I know quite a few pagans myself, uh, although I am agnostic um, and each to their own and all that. I respect people's uh, differing belie beliefs. Um, what I do find interesting about paganism uh, is that modern paganism that doesn't seem to be rooted in Irish tradition. It's like a concoction of, you know, different aspects of different indigenous traditions from around the world. Um, I mean, it would make sense to me if you're going to practice paganism in Ireland, uh, perhaps to, to look more into the Irish mythology, which at the end of the day is a very, very rich uh, field uh, uh, from which to draw 
Caitlin said, my dad wanted me to, to wanted to name me Harvest, <laughs> Harvest Moon. OK, Paul Gowron is suggesting 33 words for field. Now, I don't have that one yet. Um, we had it bef before too long, I can assure you. It's definitely one that I want to read. I just haven't had the opportunity to get it yet. Great suggestion, Paul. And that's uh, Moncom McGann, isn't it? He's the guy who presented the three-part TG Kiahar series, DMA Culture, which we watched uh, with great fervor recently. In my experience and opinion, says Rowan, rural Ireland is rather polytheistic. I, I always say that people never gave up the belief in the Dedanans, you know. <sighs> Uh, Robin Robin is uh, sort of uh, sympathising with Coda, says that he also thinks it's important for his voice to be heard in the choir, indeed multiple choirs. <laughs> Les Macanulty, Alba has also seen a big rise in paganism in recent years. It's very true. Patricia Healy Sullivan, I'm from a Druidic heritage and drawn to it. Hello from Vermont to a... Uh, hello, Patricia. Uh, good evening to you. So anyway, uh, reviews of uh, Celtic... Heritage by Alwyn Rees and Brinley Rees. Oh, yeah, the subheading is the subtitle Ancient Tradition in Ireland and Wales. A fine book, well written, a work of deep scholarship and most beautifully produced. And that's from Books and Bookmen. The things you, you know what I mean? A generation ago, women didn't exist. In size and scope, a monumental work, and that's from the Irish Press. You know these are old reviews because the Irish Press newspaper closed in the mid-90s. Uh, it's gone a quarter of a century now. A literary liqueur, a rich, condensed distillation of the myths of ancient Ireland and Wales and of the bearing on them of archaeological research and comparative philology. And that's from the Irish Independent. And from the Irish Times, abounds with interesting and illuminating ideas, a sustained attempt to get inside the mind and, and mentality of ancestors of ours who are remote, not merely in time, but also now in culture. Saskia Morgan says, hi, I'm from rural Ireland and most of the kids I know are atheist. The older generations are still quite Catholic. Yeah, I think that's a feral reflection. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fence sitter. I'm, I'm, I can't rule out the possibility that there might be a, a God and gods and deities. Uh, so I, I call myself agnostic. Uh, lapsed Christian, uh, now agnostic. Admirably written, says the New Statesman and warmly recommended to all interested in social origins. So Celtic Heritage left quite a mark at the time and con kind of continues to do so today. It's a compliment, I suppose, uh, to a work that was composed 60, almost 59 years ago, almost 60 years ago, um, to say that it is still quite relevant today because quite often what happens is a book that's published, uh, you know, uh, in relation to, especially in relation to archaeology and comparative mythology and all that, tends to be out of date a couple of decades later. And here we are almost six decades later. And I can say that that is one that definitely has to be on the bookshelves, you know, uh, along with the likes of Pronchus McCona, uh, the works um, from um, uh, Kim McCone. Um, I'm just trying to think of his name. Um, that uh, oh, it escapes me. I apologize. Um, Miles, Miles Dillon, uh, Nora Chadwick, etc. etc. Now, the whole Celtic model is being revised as we speak. The whole idea that Irish language came in the Iron Age with the Celts that, that whole idea is being revised. However, that uh, does, does not at all uh, negate any of what is within the pages of this wonderful book. So uh, one of the things I loved about it was the fact that it's scholarly. So all the sources are there, right? Um, there's there's an index and there are copious footnotes. Um, and all from manuscripts and from, you know, scholarly sources. But I found the text very accessible and I found what it was saying very interesting because there's a whole sort of deep cosmology in it. This was examining Irish mythology in the context of the places associated with that mythology. And you know, exploring the coming into being, the, you know, the coming into existence, as the chapter is called. Um, 
Now, I've got lots of margin notes in it, and I'm going to have to pick a couple of little sections to read that I really like. Um, so I will do that. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of what's in... in, in actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to read the introduction because I think um, the introduction is always a very good way, isn't it? The introduction or preface to a book. I'm going to read part of it anyway. Um, I'm going to read part of the introduction, which hopefully will give us a flavour. And again, just to state that, as always, I'm very conscious of uh, copyright laws. Uh, remember that it is illegal to reproduce in any form uh, most published most published work, except for that which is unrestricted by its publisher or its author, uh, where it's um, uh, public, you know, it's been released into the public domain or whatever, um, copyright free. So in Ireland, as, as I was saying before, uh, we have um, a fair use clause, which allows uh, what would be considered a reasonably fair amount of the material uh, to be read, or quoted, etc., uh, before such time as it's considered a breach. Uh, and so that's we have to be uh, uh, sensitive to that, uh, and I think that we always are, in fairness. Anyway, this is a little bit from the introduction to Celtic Heritage by Rhys and Rhys. Jules Cousins is in the house. Hello, Jules. Janet Cassidy says, I loved the sections on the calendar, the idea of dark and light uh, of the month as well as the year. Yes, indeed. Caitlin says, I'm in a class on Middle Irish grammar at the moment, learning why things in modern Irish are what they are. Can I order a sandwich? Oscailga? Absolutely not. <laughs> yes, at some point uh, in the not too distant future, I plan to do an episode. Uh, Caitlin, uh, you undoubtedly have um, uh, Thornison uh, in your in your library. I'm sure uh, that uh, that hefty tome. That's kind of not the sort of book. Not the sort of book you read from cover to cover. A Grammar of Old Irish by Rudolf Thornison. Uh, definitely not. Not a very readable book, more a reference book. But, um, uh, uh, what was the other one? Oh, yes, 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 yes. So there will be an episode of uh, Book Talk about Samas Cormac, Cormac's Glossary. And there's some very interesting words in there. So we'll do that one sooner rather than later, probably. And uh, there's a couple more that I find interesting. Uh, one is uh, uh, Brian O'Queeve's uh, a view of the Irish language. And isn't there, yes, uh, P.W. Joyce. Uh, Joyce did a, a book about English. I know that's about English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's interesting because it's English as it is spoken in Ireland. Uh, and so you get all sorts of uh, uh, quirks uh, in, in the way we speak English that are derived from Irish. Anyway, there's some more, uh, there's some more material for future episodes. Debbie McDonald says I got your book thank you brilliant stuff Debbie hope you enjoy it good stuff uh, hopefully that doesn't put you to sleep um, am I missing anybody Barry Jordan on YouTube says good evening Anthony from Ross Carberry in West Cork just after finishing another evening of exploring megaliths following the footsteps of the great Jack Robertson of course you're not too far from uh, Drumbeg there aren't you not Barry stayed in Ross Carberry a few years ago in the Castle Ross Hotel I can't imagine that there's much traffic down there, or there's not much tra pedestrian, tra I mean, tourist uh, traffic these days uh, with everything that's going on. So Reese and Reese introduction. And you see, already we're on half an hour, and I still haven't read anything from the book. Anne says, I'm so impressed by how quickly you can find a book from your vast almost 900 collection. And, yeah, and I was explaining, wasn't I, that even though the most reference stuff is on the shelves immediately behind me, uh, and as you progress towards the, the, the other end of the library, uh, that's the least referenced material. Um, I haven't actually indexed them separately into, you know, so I'm, get, I'm still getting used to uh, the change. Traditional tales have not always been confined to the peasantry. On the contrary, they were once a fundamental part of the culture of the aristocracy of the Celtic lands. And in Irish and Welsh tales from medieval manuscripts, there are references to the recitation of tales by poets of high rank. In a Welsh story, it is related how the magician Gwydion, uh, and the Welsh speakers might correct me on my pronunciations, 
and his 11 companions arrive at a prince's court in the guise of poets. The guests are invited to tell a story. Lord, said Gwydion, it is our custom that the first night after one comes to a nobleman, the master. The first night after one comes to a nobleman, the master poet shall speak. I will tell a tale gladly. Gwydion, the story goes on, was the best storyteller in the world. In an Irish story, the language of which shows it to have been written in the 8th century, the learned poet Forgol recites a story to Mungon, an Irish, sorry, an Ulster king, every night throughout a whole winter from Samhain to Bialtana, and that is from approximately November the 1st to May the 1st. A phrase still to be heard in connection with storytelling. The custom of telling the stories at night and during the winter is not to be dismissed as merely a matter of convenience. Reports concerning peoples from parts of Native America, Europe, Africa and Asia show them to be almost unan unanimous in prohibiting the telling of sacred stories in summer or in daylight, except on certain special occasions. Similarly, the significance of telling the stories around the fire cannot be fully appreciated without reference to the central role of the hearth and the fire altar in Indo-European and other traditions. While the recitation of tales by poets brings to mind that prose interspersed with speech poems was a narrative form known in ancient Egypt as in medieval Europe, in Vedic India as in modern Ireland. In medieval Ireland and Wales, poets were not regarded as eccentric individuals as they are in the modern world. They were members of a privileged order within the learned class. Though in Ireland their profession was largely hereditary, their apprenticeship was both long and arduous. We mentioned this recently, didn't we? And an essential part of it consisted in learning hundreds of tales, quote, to narrate them to kings and lords and gentlemen, unquote. The learned class comprising druids and poets was comparable in many ways with the Brahman caste in India and an account of the art, status and conduct of Irish and Welsh court poets was described by an eminent Orientalist as, quote, almost a chapter in the history of India under a different name, unquote. These classes are survivals in the East and in the West from the social and religious hierarchy of the peoples who spoke the ancient Indo-European languages. Isn't this fantastic? As a storyteller, says Rowan Grove, I have some which I may only tell in the dark half of the year. There you go. Interesting. Jerry Andrade says, the prehistory guys mentioned you on Tuesday night's questions. Hope you make a visit soon. I love the prehistory guys. Oh, they're brilliant. Really, really, really think they're class. M. Elena Guzman says, look forward to you covering Cormac's book, Viewing Session, from New Hampshire. Hello and good evening to New Hampshire from the Boyne Valley. Patricia Wardell says, thank you very, Trieste. I also received your book. Brilliant. Quivine de Barra has a great book, Galga, a uh, Radical Revolution. Uh, and that's one that's not in my collection. So there you go. Uh, there is evidence from the Celtic countries and from India that the poets were also the official historians and the royal genealogists. The poet's praises confirmed and sustained the king in his kingship, while his satire could blast both the king and his kingdom. There was a tradition that the learned poets, the Philly, F-I-L-I-D, or I think it's, it's Philly or Philly, isn't it, of Ireland, were once judges. They were certainly the experts on the prerogatives and duties of the king, and a master poet, Olof, was himself equal to a king before the law. Such priestly functions as divination and prophecy also came within the province of these early Irish poets who, it may be added, wore cloaks of bird feathers, as do the shamans of Siberia, when, through ritual and trance, they conduct their audiences on journeys to another world. And you know what? That is probably closer to a view of uh, Neolithic religion. Uh, I mean, this is ostensibly um, stems from me the medieval period, you know. I recommend Michael Dames's Mythic Ireland. Yes, uh, Ireland, uh, a, uh, a Sacred Journey. It was republished as um, 
And that's from Catherine Woodruff. Yeah, good suggestion. Okay, that is noted, duly noted. Um, so anyway, I want to skip forward to one of the sections of uh, Celtic heritage that really impressed Philip. The word for poet is pronounced like Philip, the snake. The stake, the snake. <laughs> I'm thinking about St. Patrick and Ophiuchus again. Um, okay, Philip. The Philip. Hmm, didn't know that. I would always have said Phila or, or Philly. But anyway, there you go. Philip more more so. So there's a there's a chapter called um The Center, which I found uh, really brilliant. Uh, so much so that there are uh, copious notes uh, and markings, uh, margin notes, etc. Uh, this section sort of dealing with what the scholars would call cosmology, and when you're when you're talking about cosmology, oh, also the coming into existence. I have to read sections of that as well. The cosmology in the scholarly terminology doesn't actually refer to the sort of cosmology that we think about when we think about Carl Sagan. Um, you know, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, and what's that? What's the young fella's name? The very, very, I said Brian Cox. Um, more so um, to do with cosmology, as in uh, the sort of oh, how how do I ex even explain the word cosmology uh, in the way that it's meant in the in the scholarly texts? I think it's to do with sort of you know, how your uh, existence and your um, locality and your place on the earth um, are part of or interact with or are seen to be, you know, contiguous or part of a greater whole. Um, and so the act of setting down uh, a sacred place uh, is very important. And so we get, and I think it might have been Reese and Reese, and if it's not, that's my mistake, but it might have been those who first drew attention to the idea that uh, Chower, uh, or Tara, uh, which comes from Tia uh, Moor, uh, but in Irish, T-E-A-M-A-I-R, or variant spellings of it, that the first part of the word, uh, the Irish word, uh, is the equivalent in Irish of uh, the Greek temenos or the Latin templum, uh, meaning, uh, you know, a, a, a temple or a sacred place. And the idea of that you see in many cultures, and again, uh, Jung talks quite a lot about this, you know, that uh, a temenos was like, uh, and you see it also in the megalithic art, by the way, a dot with a circle around it, the dot representing, you know, I suppose, um, this is my my way of understanding it, not necessarily the scholarly way of understanding it, the dot representing that spot which, which roots you to cosmos, which roots you to the earth, uh, and around it, of course, that uh, ring or hoop, uh, that defining border, uh, which marks the sacred space of your being. Um, and there are lots of, uh, well, especially, as I say, Jung, uh, there's lots to say about uh, what that symbol means and, and what it means, especially when you see it in dreams. And, of course, he was very, very interested in uh, the symbolism uh, and the meaning of mandalas, uh, so much so that he carved one into stone at his, uh, at his uh, lakeside home in, in, in uh, Bollingen in Switzerland. Um, so what did I want to read? Coming into existence, I found fascinating for a couple of reasons. And that is the fact that it brought into um, it brought into mind or it brought to mind uh, the fact that, uh, you know, Ireland has always been divided into provinces or kingdoms or territories in all of the mythologies when you go back. Oh, sorry, I knew there was something important that I needed to say too before I start that, 
remember that I'm talking about the, the yes, I'm going to mark that with my finger so I know where to start. And we're at 40 minutes already. Um, so I think Reese and Reese were the first ones to categorize the groupings of tails into larger categories. They, they, uh, they come up with this uh, division of four, which we've seen copied in later works, all down through uh, the past 60 years. And so those four cycles of mythology, in, our, in Irish mythology now, I'm not talking about the Welsh stuff here, but in Irish mythology, you have the mythological cycle, which is Laura Gawala, um, the Daedanans, the wars with the Fomorians and the Fervolog, etc., etc., uh, and their conquest by the mortals, uh, the Gael or the Milesians. You then have the Ulster cycle. Uh, the, the, I mean, the core of that absolutely is Toynbo Cúlnge, but there are lots of Remscale and, and other supplementary tales and even some unrelated tales that form part of what you would call... Um, the Ulster cycle, so Setanta, Cúchollan, uh, and Toynbo Cúlnge, Queen Maeve, and all that, and the bulls, the battle for the bulls, um, is a huge part of that. Third in line, and it's chronological as well, because they reckon the earliest is mythological, that's the oldest mythology, that next comes Ulster cycle, uh, and that next comes the Finn cycle, Finn and the Fianna, uh, pertaining to Fionn McCool, uh, that great warrior caught the salmon, or who ate the, or gained all the knowledge of the Salmon of Knowledge uh, and went on to become the leader uh, of uh, the Fianna. And, of course, uh, uh, Oshin and Oscar and Jermot and Grania, all that stuff would form part of the Finn cycle. The Finn cycle is one that we see written down less because apparently it, it, it was uh, told by the peasantry. They reckon it was based around war bands, medieval war bands, itinerant war bands who never sort of particularly settled anywhere but roved the land uh, and were uh, honour and duty bound uh, to do their things, you know. Uh, and then lastly, the historical uh, cycle, which of course <clears throat> um, also introduces Christianity with the arrival of St. Patrick. Uh, and everything we've been discussing in, uh, was in an episode 119 when we were talking about scribes and kings uh, and, and everything that basically follows uh, which is less mythological and, and more historical. But look, I want to say something on that front, and, and it's very briefly, I've touched upon it before, and we're going to have to do a bigger episode on it in the future. And that is the fact that the stories of the great saints of Ireland, especially St. Patrick, you could add in St. Bridget and St. Colum Kill as well. But the story of St. Patrick is uh, full of mythology, you know, uh, miracles, and, and, and Bridget is the same. Miracle after miracle after miracle, uh, the um, uh, is it Cogitosis's life of Bridget is just full of accounts of all these wonderful miracles that are supposed to have happened but not to be too cynical um, uh, because I don't also want to negate the possibility that some of those things did happen but let's be honest it's unlikely most of it is mythological so there are the four cycles and I think Reese and Reese introduced the uh, categorization of those cycles uh, and that, as I say, has been copied ever since, which I suppose demonstrates how um, um, how much um, they have uh, inspired, um, you know, how much their work has been respected uh, by scholars who, who followed in their footsteps. And... Even at the time of the Milesians, I mean, you know, if you go back to the Fervolog, for instance, Ireland is divided into five provinces. Uh, and of course, uh, the largest of those provinces was ruled by King Slánia, who's the one who's supposed to be buried on the Hill of Slain here, the, overlooking the Boyne Valley, uh, which is one that I'm interested in. But at the time of the Milesians, um, The island was divided into two halves, Le Quin and Le Moga. Uh, Le Quin, Le being the probably the, the uh, early Irish form of Le, uh, Lahore, Teresh, uh, uh, Ahucht, half past eight, half La meaning half, Le Quin, the half of Con, and Le Moga, or La Moga, the half of Mug, uh, divided along the middle of the island by the Esker Rieda. 
Now, the Escarilla is in great stretches. Uh, it, it, well, in, in stretches, it is uh, formed of natural, uh, I, I believe, glacial features. Um, uh, what do they call them? Eskers. Yeah. That's why it's called Escaria Dance Me. <laughs> oh, live TV. Don't you just love it? If I could rehearse that, you know that wouldn't have happened. <laughs> at least you get to have a laugh at my expense. <laughs> um, and what I find fascinating about that is how the division of the island has played out in its real history, of course. It isn't just a mythological thing. You know, the idea that in, in cosmological terms, that the island is never seen as one whole complete unit. And of course, that comes really strongly into play with the stories about Ishnak, which we're going to talk about, because that's in the chapter uh, dealing with the cosmology, um, dealing with the centre. You know, when we see the four provinces united in the centre by the fifth, and the fifth province is, is a stone. It is Isle Namiran, this magical stone that is seen to unite uh, the provinces. Um, fascinatingly, and this is one of the reasons I'm really, really fascinated by this. Now, the line isn't the same, okay? Wait till you hear this. I've said this before. Uh, I, 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 I'm sure some of you haven't heard it. The northern part of Ireland and the southern part of Ireland were once situated more than 420 million years ago. Were once situated on two different continents. Laurentia and Avalonia, if I'm not mistaken, Laurentia was the northern of the continents, uh, Avalonia the southern. Uh, Avalon, I presume there's a, a link there with the, the mythology of, of Arthur, and if I'm mistaken about that, that's completely my fault. Uh, they came together. Uh, they were separated by an ocean which modern geologists refer to as the Iapetus Ocean, I-A-P-E-T-U-S. And the, the two parts smashed together eventually, and formed the island of Ireland. And the fascinating thing is, now the seam, we call it, geologists call it the Iapetus Suture. And if you want to know more about this, uh, refer to uh, my book, Mythical Ireland, New Light on the Ancient Past, where there is actually a chapter about it. The Remarkable Geological Secret of the Newgrange Curb Stones. Um, so the consequence of this is that fossils found in rocks say if you go to where the seam the seam is not quite the same as the Escarita it comes from the Shannon Estuary across Ireland sort of northeastwards to Claharhead in County Loud which is the place where they got the stones for Newgrange uh, so not exactly following the Escarita a little bit more diagonal but if you walk the coastline in County Louth and you pick up rocks with fossils in them north of Clutter Head, the fossils in those rocks are vastly different to the fossils that you pick up in rocks south of Clutter Head. And, and, and that is because they belong, they are of creatures that lived on this earth hundreds of millions of years ago uh, on separate continents uh, that eventually smashed together. Fascinating stuff. Um, but I, I, I think it's very interesting that we have this constant division of Ireland into territories. <clears throat> what happens is the Milesians mimic this La, La Moga and La Quin because uh, Eremon and Eber, <clears throat> the two Milesian brothers, decide to, to rule jointly in the first year of the Milesian reign. <clears throat> and uh, Eremon takes the northern portion of Ireland and Eber takes the south. I presume they were divided at the Boyne River. Um, this is where they built the Mill Mount according to tradition. Uh, to mark uh, the the splitting or the to, to mark the border or the division of the of the provinces. Anyway, very quickly because um, I got to keep with the program here. Um, yeah, we're talking here about Laura Gawala. They were talking about the Book of Invasions, and this is very interesting. I I, I took a note of this. It is well to remember that the monks are poets who compiled it. That is the Book of Invasions lived much closer to the pre-Christian world than we do. The work still retains features which the study of other mythologies would lead us to expect 
in myths about the beginnings of things. And the more one studies it, the more one is persuaded that the compilers had some understanding of the nature of the material they were endeavouring to reconcile with the new Christian teaching. Uh, and this is in answer to the charge uh, exerted or, 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 or um, made by scholars, mo modern scholars, who have been tempted to dismiss the whole composition as a medieval work of fiction. Which book of yours is the geology? Well, it's not the geology of Ireland, Connie. It's just a, a chapter about that. Uh, that's the book. It's Mythical Ireland, A New Light on the Ancient Past. Thanks for asking, by the way. That's the book that contains um, uh, information because this this place where the, you see, the, the, where, the, where they call it the Yapetus Suture, where, the, the two chunks of Ireland came together and the Clare Head, apparently this is the only part of the suture running all the way down through Ireland. The only part where you can see it uh, at the surface is at Clogher Head, where the rock formations are like that. They're vertical. And the builders of Newgrange used this to their advantage. They were able to prise out the rocks um, as a result of their vertical formation, saving them a lot of manual labor in having to excavate, uh, to quarry down deep into the, into the ground. As we've already mentioned, the five invasions of Ireland before the advent of the Gael were those of Kezair, Partholon, Nemed, Fervolog, and Tua the Danon. We shall mention some of their general characteristics before proceeding to a fuller discussion of their individual and collective symbolisms. You see, I want to read just snippets, but oh, it's very difficult. I want to read the whole lot, you know. Um, highly, anyway, look, you know that when a, a book is uh, featured on Book Talk, it's kind of one that you probably would like to have on your shelf if you're interested in any of this stuff. From a, from a mythological point of view, nothing really exists until it has been formed, defined, and named. And inasmuch as Laura Gawala Aaron is concerned with the origin of physical features, boundaries, and names, it retains some of the essentials of a cosmogonic myth, as in a creation myth, a beginning myth. When Partholone arrived, there were only three lakes and nine rivers in Ireland. Pardon me. Seven more lakes burst forth in his day, four in the time of Nemed and three in the time of the Tua the Danon. A recurrent motif is the eruption of a lake at the digging of a grave and the naming of the lake after the person buried therein. Cathy May Dao is in the house and says, it's a nice surprise. Hello, Cathy May. It's great to see you. I wonder, am I missing anybody on YouTube? Julianne Osborne is on YouTube. Hello, Julianne. Great to see you. Says, excellent talk, Anthony. Well, I'm, well, do you know what? I'm glad you haven't fallen asleep. That's always a good start. Any jokes? Uh, oh, yeah, I have a joke. Um, did you know that boomerangs are Australia's biggest export? And they're also its biggest import. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and so I took notes here uh, that Ireland was divided into two portions or two provinces, two kingdoms during the time of the Milesians, three areas or regions in the time of the Nemedians, four in the time of the Parthalonians, and five in the time of the Fervolog. This is why Celtic Heritage is such a wonderful book. It, it puts together things that are kind of obvious, but you have to be kind of thinking of them. Uh, they put the stuff together very, very well. A dispute over boundaries could not be settled on grounds of expediency. The oldest and most learned historians had to be called upon to recount how Ireland was divided in the beginning. A silly dad joke. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm very fond of my silly dad jokes. Uh, okay, I need to move on. Uh, and this is, I suppose, actually, this reminds me a little bit of the work of Mircea Iliadi. Uh, they say in a paragraph here, and I have marked it, this is the way of all ancient cultures. Life is meaningful in as much as it is an imitation or reenactment of what the gods did in the beginning. Reality is acquired solely through repetition or participation. 
Something which lacks an exemplary model is meaningless, i.e. it lacks reality. And one only need to think of Greek mythology to realize that th these models are not confined to what is morally approved. They relate to all human situations. Okay, I need to move forward because we are on 55. See what I mean? Yeah, I'll do a 20 minute live and suddenly you're an hour in and you're still waffling. Uh, this is the center, uh, and this is based around a text. I don't have a scholarly uh, translation of this text yet, and I really want one, uh, and it is uh, the settling of the manor of Tara. Um, uh, Fenton, it was Fenton MacBawkra, the survivor of the, the flood, declares that it is right to take the provinces of Ireland from Tara and from Ishnak, two sites which are for Ireland like two kidneys in a beast. Ishnok, the midpoint of the island, is in Meath. Well, it's in modern county Westmeath. Tara is in Brega or Brea. But this territory, territorial duality does not seem to have been absolute. For according to the Book of Rights, Bre Brea is included within the larger unity of Meath. It behoves us, therefore, to look more closely at the roles of the great centres of Irish mythology. And we will begin with Tara. So, uh, I, I need to kind of summarize because I can't really read the whole lot. What he's talking about here is a cosmological plan for the layout of Tara and also for the layout of Ishnak. So if you look at this uh, figure, I think this kind of does it justice. Um, so he's talking about Tara and the state. So you have the provinces, Ulster, Leinster, Munster and Connacht and Tara being at the center. Uh, and, you know, uh, you could say the same really for for Ishnak because, I mean, this is essentially a map of Ishnak too because what Ishnak does is it joins, it is the sacred um, correlation, it is the sacred joining point, uh, the union of the provinces in this sacred fifth province, which is a mystical uh, province. And by the way, Michael James's book has a, a wonderful uh, way of uh, explaining that. Uh, which is fabulous. So everything's laid out uh, elaborately and to a plan. Uh, and so moving on, we see in figure nine, the ninefold plan. Uh, and it almost looks a little bit like a mandala, except for it's square. And then there's the cosmos and the calendar, and he's reminding us of, of Chinese cosmology here and the way the months uh, uh, go around. Uh, the center uh, and he even talks about remember we did how could you forget uh, remember we did um togal brunya da derga the destruction of Dardurga's hospital which i think took us four episodes and uh, not difficult that uh, and he even talks talks about the arrangement um the connection between Crohor, Khonkobar, and the calendar is further attested by a text from the Book of Leinster. Khonkobar's mother, Ness, had 12 foster fathers. He himself became king of Ulster by first being granted a nominal kingship for one year. There were 365 persons in his household. That is, the number of days in the year is the number of men that are in Khonkobar's household. So everything is cosmological. We know of no direct evidence connecting the divisions of Ireland or the court of the King of Tara with the calendar. But it should be remembered that the very division of the year into four seasons, like the division of a land into four quarters, is an idea and not, not a natural phenomenon. The account of the construction of Brickrew's Hall certainly embodies a calendrical symbolism. It took seven of the Ulster champions to carry a single uh, lath and 30 of the chief artificers of Ireland were employed in constructing and arranging the building. The hall contained the couches of the 12 heroes, and it was built in the course of one year. So they were building it in real calendrical time as well, which is fascinating. Now, what else? Although the four great provinces and the centre constitute the state, the ordered cosmos, they do not comprise all that is. Beyond the confines of Ireland and beneath its surface lies another world. 
And as we shall see in part three, Celtic stories are largely concerned with the intrusion upon the cosmos of strange, chaotic beings and with the adventures of mortals who enter that other world. Similarly, beyond the ramparts of Tara, the microcosmic symbol, there is a world that is other and often hostile. The opposition between these two worlds is expressed by another analogy which likens Tara and Ireland to the board on which the game called Brandov was played. Uh, this was a game in which the king piece and four supporting pieces occupied the centre of the board. I, I think Bran, uh, Bran is a name for one of the dogs in mythology, but does, does Bran mean, um, a dove means black. Um, hang on. Does Bran mean... Um, a raven. Am I wrong about that? Probably wrong. Let me just look up that word for a moment. Now I'm getting sidetracked. R rabbit holes. Yes, a raven. Bran. The black raven. I wonder. That's interesting. This was a game in which the king piece and four supporting pieces occupied the centre of the board. And a comparison with the Welsh Tolbrud and Swedish Talbot, Tablut, about which more is known. Tablut. T-A-B-L-U-T presumably connected uh, with the word tablet, I don't know, about which more is known, suggests that there were eight opposing pieces distributed along the sides of the board. board. And I wonder, is this similar to the Irish uh, uh, um, Fechil, uh, which Lou has to play with Nuadu before he's allowed into Tara uh, during Kahmai Chura, uh, that episode. Uh, and he, 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 he performs a move called the Crow of Lou, the Enclosure of Lou. Not sure what that means. Comparison with these games also suggests that a board with 49 holes or squares, seven by seven, like the one recovered from a lake dwelling in West Meath, probably not too far from Ishnach, is the appropriate size. The settling of the Manor of Tara states that the Green of Tara had seven views on every side, while according to a poem which portrays Ireland as a Brandov board, Tara is the central square the four squares around it are the provincial capitals. The king piece is the king of Ireland and his four defenders are the four provincial kings. Yes, a little bit like chess, Janet. Yes, exactly. The centre of the plain of Foyle is Tara's castle, Delightful Hill, out in the exact centre of the plain, like a mark on a party-coloured party Branov board. Advance thither, it will be a profitable step. Leap up on that square, which is fitting for the Branon, or king, the board is fittingly thine. I would draw thy attention, O white of tooth, to the noble squares for proper, the, sorry, proper for the Branon, Tara, Cashel, Crohan, Crohan, Nace, and Ulyach. Let them be occupied by thee. A golden Branon with his band art thou with thy fourth, four provincials, thou, O king of Brea. On yonder square, and a man on each square around thee. Fantastic stuff. The game implies that Tara and the cosmos of which it is the centre are surrounded by hostile forces. These board games were favourite pastimes in the households of kings and nobles, and the evidence of Welsh and Irish laws shows that they were invested with considerable significance. Originally, their purpose may have been similar to that of the ritual dice contests of Tibetan festivals, whereby the Dalai Lama defeated a man from among the people who played the part of the king of the demons, etc., etc., etc. Whereas Tara, and I don't want to read too much more, uh, and I, 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 we're, at a, we're at an hour already. Whereas Tara is the seat of kingship, several considerations associate Ishnak with the Druids. It was at Ishnak that Mija, an eponym of Mead, the county, the modern county, which Ishnak is not in, it's in West Mead, <coughs> chief druid of the people of Nemed lit the first fire. The fire blazed for seven years. So that, quote, so that he shed the fierceness of the fire for a time upon the four quarters of Ireland, unquote. And you can see the cosmology uh, implied, implicit in the mythology here. 
From that fire were kindled every chief fire and every chief hearth in Ireland. And of course, in this respect, we think back to the time of St. Patrick's arrival when he challenged the king at Tara uh, by lighting a fire before the king had first lit the fire at Tara. Same idea, it seems, transplanted from one to the other, from Tara to Ishnach or from Ishnach to Tara. Quote, wherefore Meej's successor is entitled to a sack of corn with a pig from every housetop in Ireland. Unquote. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm fond, I'm not, well, I mean, I'm fond of the porridge like the dog that was, but I'm certainly fond of the pig, I tell you. I like me rashers and, and, and me, me uh, sausage rolls. <laughs> Sorry, I'll continue. Stop talking, Anthony. And the indigenous druids said, evil media upon to us is the fire that has been kindled in the land. On Meej's instructions, these druids were marshaled into a house and their tongues were cut out. He buried the tongues in the ground of Ishnok and sat upon them. Another story of the lighting of a symbolical fire is linked with the neighbourhood of Ishnok. It is told to, to explain how Delbaith got his name. Banished with his five sons from Munster, quote, he went to the cairn of Fiachu and kindled there a druidical fire out of which burst five streams of flame. And he set him a son to each stream. From these descend the five Delvnas. Hence the name Delvide, shape fire, clung to him. Brilliant stuff. The lighting of a fire as a ritual proclamation of the ascendancy of the one who lights it occurs in several other Celtic stories. For example, St. David, on taking possession of the land which bears his name, lit a fire to the dismay of the local chieftain. Quote, the kinder of that fire shall excel in all powers and renown in every part that the smoke of his sacrifice has covered, even to the end of the world. Unquote. Same story is told about St. Patrick. His the druids tell King Lyra, you know, if this fire isn't extinguished this night, then its flame will burn for the rest of time. Similarly, St. Patrick... <laughs> Why don't I just read? Uh, through lighting the Paschal fire, usurped the privileges of the Druids who were preparing a fire at Tara. The story of the founding of the monastery at Loch Ree by St. Ciaran recalls Nemed's company of eight. With eight upon the loch, Ciaran travelled, but with 1,200 on land. A fire was lit by the clergy. Said his wizards to Jermot, the purpose for which yon fire is kindled tonight is such that it will never be put out. According to the Welsh laws, the right to enter and occupy land which one's father occupied until his death was the right to uncover the fire. Mention may also be made of the firm tradition that a humble squatter who builds a house on the waste during the course of one night and has smoke rising from the chimney by the dawn of the new day gains possession of the site and the land around to the distance to which he can throw an axe from his cabin door. <laughs> I love it. Oh, brilliant. Oh, I love that stuff. <laughs> Geraldus Cambrensis. I'm skipping a little bit here because I'm conscious that we're nearly out of time. So not mind you that we're restricted. I mean, I'm not restricted necessarily. I've, I, 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 I don't have to finish at a particular time, but it's just I think when you get to between an hour and an hour and a half, that's when people sort of start to taper off in terms of energy levels. Um, Geraldus Cambrensis records that the stone of divisions at Ishnok is said to be the navel of Ireland. And in a poem, Finton says, it is long since I drank a drink of the deluge over the navel of Ishnok. This is no chance metaphor. The centre of the world is symbolised as the navel or omphalos, or the belly button, in many other traditions ranging from Indonesia to Greece and Peru. Nor is the choice of Ishnok as the site of the original fire fortuitous, for the belief that there is a hearth or a fire altar at the midpoint is also common to other cosmologies. According to the Pythagoreans, there is fire at the centre of the universe. Agni, the Vedic sacrificial fire, is the navel of the earth. Quote, this altar, altar, A-L-T-A-R, is the furthermost border of the earth, the sacrifice is the navel of the world, unquote. Agni is also a pillar at the parting of the ways and is compared to a column supporting the five kindreds. The pillar stone at Ishnok was five ridged, symbolizing the five provinces at the center. Around it was marked out a measure of land consisting of the portion of each province in Ishnok. 
Here, as at Tara, the world was symbolised by a series of microcosms, each set within the other. In the cosmologies of other lands, the centre is often an axis which extends from the netherworld to the heavens above, uniting the universe vertically as well as horizontally. We could call that an axis mundi, couldn't we? I think. Or at the centre there is a shaft which is the mouth of the nether regions into which the waters of the deluge flowed. A hole in the ground like the Roman mundus into which the spirits of the dead depart or an oracular cave as at Delphi. No tradition of this kind survives at Ishnok unless it be that the tongues of the Aboriginal Druids beneath it have that significance. But we would suggest that the other world is represented there in another way. Westminster, the outer fifth province which leads to the House of Dunn, that's Dunn who was one of the Malaysian brothers who drowned off the coast of Ireland before they landed, has its place at Ishnach along with the other four provinces. It is perhaps significant that whereas the sons of Mil encountered the kings of the Tua de Danon at Tara, it was in Westminster and at Ishnach that they held converse with the queens or the tutelary deities, the goddesses. Uh, they are Banba, Fola and Eru. Uh, uh, reference previous episodes. Uh, we definitely did an episode about Eru. At uh, Tara, the bounded cosmos is represented by four within four within four. At Ishnak, the cosmos, together with its source in the primordial chaos, is represented by five within five within five. In the stories, Ishnak has no ramparts. It differs from the four-sided Mount Meru of Indian tradition and other pyramidal symbols of the centre and compares rather with the five-pointed star and the five-petaled flower with which the alchemists sometimes represented the quintessence in the centre of the cross of the elements. I think I'm going to have to leave it there because, I mean, I, I there's more underlying sections here that I can read. Will I read a couple more? Will I hang on? Is everybody... I uh, don't seem to have any comments on Facebook for ages. Is everything okay? Or has it... Sharon Holt is saying hello on YouTube. Hello, Sharon. Checked in late. Don't worry about that. Yeah, there's... There's a, hang on, I just check the uh, computer version. Yeah, so I'm seeing comments on the computer version that I'm not seeing on the phone, so there's some issue there. Uh, Janet Cassidy says five pointed like a pentagram. Yeah, and I'm thinking of the the I'm thinking of the pattern that Venus makes over its five synodic periods over a period of eight years. Um, is the lotus flower five petaled? That's very important. Uh, Caitlin Moon says Marty at Ishnak reminds me of the Oracle of Delphi he has a wisdom and a connection that's similar in my opinion uh, Marty Mulligan he's brilliant yes he is uh, seeing comments but not many yeah so I'm seeing a lot of comments on, on the computer that I'm not seeing on the phone at all so there's something wrong with the phone feed but I'm only seeing the very latest comments so I'm sorry that uh, there's four and when a new one appears the, the bottom one the fourth disappears anyway uh, just a little bit more, and then we'll call it uh, we'll call it an episode. In diverse cosmologies, the mountain in the centre of the earth is the source of the world's rivers. The centre is symbolised not only by a mountain, a pillar, a fire altar, and a tree, but also by the well of life. Uh, the tree, by the way, is very interesting. The bile, b i l e, in in Irish tradition, a sacred tree. <clears throat> There is more than a suggestion of this in the derivation of 12 chief rivers from a mythological event which occurred at Ishnach. It was during an assembly held there at the accession of Jermot, son of Kiarabal, or Kiarabal, uh, Dermot O'Carroll, that a great hailstorm fell upon the gathering. Quote, such was its greatness that the one shower left 12 chief streams in Ireland forever. Unquote. Wow. Another version of the story attributes the streams to a miracle wrought by St. Ciaran to relieve a drought. And just as Mija, who lit the first fire, was entitled to a hearth tax, to Ciaran was entitled to, to a, so Ciaran was entitled to a general cess throughout Ireland. In the colloquy of the ancients, <coughs> that is, Akalo Nasionorach, when Kailche, Kailche Patrick and their companions were 
quote, at the pillar stone of Ishnak, unquote, Oshin went in search of water for the feast. I think this is fascinating. <clears throat> he went alone and kept his face turned backwards to, to see that no one watched him. And he goes to a place called Finfeskl, uh, uh, also known as, no, uh, what's, uh, before I read it, I'm trying to test my own memory here. Um, uh, there are two names for the well at Ishnak. I think one is Finn Fleskach, the bright and ever flowing well, and the other. Oh, it's not coming to me. No, it's too late at night. That's what's wrong. That's my excuse. He went alone and kept his face turned backwards to see that no one watched him. In this fashion, he came to the white rimmed well of Ishnak, which no one had found since the Battle of Gaura. There he saw eight beautiful salmon clothed in their diversely shaded hues the intricacy of the place being such that they needed not to fear anything. He took eight sprigs of watercress and eight of brook lime, and dipping a pail into the well, he scooped up the eight salmon alive and plunging madly. On his return, he set the vessel with the, with the cress and brook lime floating in it before the King of Ireland, and the night was spent in feasting and storytelling. So we've definitely got... Um, Neil Hughes got Island of the Setting Sun this morning in the post. Brilliant stuff, Neil. Delighted to hear that. Uh, so there are hues, obviously, here of the Salmon of Knowledge, sacred well with salmon growing in it, and it's important to the feast. Ishnak is not, in fact, the hydrographic centre of Ireland, but the derivation of the 12 streams from a miracle wrought there would appear to endow it with that significance. Furthermore, the secret well brings to mind the mysterious well of Sagish, or Cunnel as well, which nobody durst visit except Nechton and his three cupbearers, like Mimir's well at the root of the Scandinavian world tree. This well was the source of inspiration and knowledge. Over it grew the nine hazels of wisdom, quote, out of which were obtained the feats of the sages, F-E-A-T-S, unquote. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Forgive me for a moment. Throat's a little bit dry from all the talking. I will shut up shortly. The hazelnuts dropped into the well and caused bubbles of mystic inspiration to form on the streams that issued from it. Alternatively, the nuts were eaten by the salmon in the well or they passed into the River Boyne. And I, I, I also see the symbolism of the well of Segish where the salmon of knowledge was supposed to have grown uh, from a from a fry to a smolt and, and and eventually to a large fish, uh, I see that as the spawning pool. You know, it's it's like the mystical or the the mythological uh, 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 version of the spawning pool. They those destined to partake of the nuts or of the salmon obtained the gifts of the seer and the poet, as in this famous story of the Salmon of Knowledge and Fionn McCool previously told. And you might have seen the quote I put up today on Mythical Ireland uh, from um, the quote from my book, Mythical Ireland, uh, uh, which mentioned Finnegus the Wise, uh, and he was the one who was waiting for the Salmon of Knowledge, but it was fated to end up uh, with Finn, and that's what happened. The location of the well is variously described. It is the source of the Boyne, the source of the Shannon, the source of the seven chief rivers of Ireland, and it has its counterpart in the land of promise, where the five rivers that flow from it are the five centres. Do you know what? I, I, I could read sections of that, and I've only read a very small amount of it. Uh, that is the wonderfully rich treasure that is Reese and Reese's a Celtic heritage, ancient tradition in Ireland and Wales. As I say, first published more than a half century ago, almost six decades ago, actually. Uh, it runs to about 350 pages. I believe that you, uh, my, my, uh, my uh, wonderful uh, 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 live mits uh, uh, viewers, uh, will, will find it. Uh, a, fa a fabulous resource. You will love it. It's readable. I mean, I know some of the language is a little bit um, highfalutin, maybe. Uh, it's it's a little bit professorial. A little bit. 
but by and large, it is a wonderful book. It just makes so many connections. Um, and not in a sort of a, not in a sort of a facile or, uh, you know, opaque, woo-woo, mystical, kind of new agey kind of way, you know? Uh, hang on, let's find it here now. Copy the link in here if I find, oh yeah, I don't know, I have to do an advanced search. Author, Reese, title, Celtic Heritage. Uh, there's a copy on abebooks.com for £3.86. So I'm going to uh, paste that in as a link on YouTube and on Facebook, where you can go to ABE Books and get your own copy. There are several available, £3.86. Seven pounds seventy nine, five pounds, seven pounds seventy, seven pounds fifty, nine pounds fifty. Yeah, there's loads of copies available, and I'm sure there's loads on Amazon as well. Get yourself a copy, do yourself a favor. It's a fabulous piece of work. Um, and uh, do you know what? Um, I'm, I'm sure I could do a whole uh, two or three more episodes on it. You know, another one to add to the library. I'm, I'm encouraging people uh, to take up the Japanese art of tsundoku. Uh, which is the gathering of books which one may or may not ever get around to reading. But anyway, look, it's wonderful, you know. Um, so I hope you enjoy that. Uh, I, I, I just think it's one of those. It's, it's, a, it's, it's one that when you read it, uh, you, A, you, you know you'll go back to it time and time again. And B, you know that it's an influential work. That's the word I was trying to think earlier on, by the way, when the brain froze. It's influential. And you know it's influential because you see it referred to. In, in, in many other scholarly works. Uh, and of course, for sources, it is fabulous. So if you want the source of anything that's in there, it's, it's, it's all in the footnotes at the back. None of this trying to avoid uh, scrutiny. Uh, it's it's uh, entirely uh, transparent. So um, I can tell you folks that I will not be doing uh, any live stream tomorrow night because tomorrow night being Friday night is date night. When myself and my good wife Anne uh, participate in uh, a feast, which, by the way, is cooked by myself. It is my turn for cooking on Fridays uh, after a long week. And uh, hopefully kids all uh, finished school and college and me finished work for the week. Well, the day job, <laughs> not, not the mythical Ireland work, never finished that. That's 24-7. Um, so maybe we might do something over the weekend. Um the book talks, I think, is going to make a very interesting series. Uh, and it's not designed to replace Live Irish Myths. Live Irish Myths will continue to happen on Monday, Monday nights, uh, hopefully every week, as long as we, we can. Look, we just keep going as long as we can. Uh, book talk, I'm not going to pencil in a specific night or nights or times for it. I'll do it when I can do it. Uh, and it's important, I think, you know, you have to kind of look after yourself, don't you? You know, it's important for me to get such thing as sleep, which I tend not to get enough of, as you can imagine. Anyway, look, as always, it's been lovely having having you in the in the library. Um, I look forward to the time. Uh, I really do. I cherish the the time when we can come together uh, physically. Uh, some of us, anyway, and unite in one place. Doesn't doesn't have to be. It probably would be better if it wasn't here. In fact. Uh, but perhaps someday, uh, as a group, we'll get to explore uh, Ishnak and Tara and Bruna Bonia, et etc. et cetera. Uh, But in the meantime, it's always a great pleasure to share the space with you virtually. Uh, it's, it's, it's always a, a wonderful interactive experience. We always seem to have a great knockabout. Um, love the comments and the questions. Uh, don't forget to keep your, um, uh, your suggestions coming. I should mention, too, that uh, there will be a few episodes. And I'm not saying which ones beforehand. There will be a few episodes where I will be reading from a duplicate copy of the book in question. And, and I'll be giving it away at the end of the episode. Um, I have to find a more effective method of doing that. Liking and sharing posts apparently isn't the way to do it these days. But we'll find, we'll find a way to do that. Uh, in the meantime, if you look up uh, Reese and Reese uh, Celtic Heritage uh, Review... Uh, there's a review on JSTOR. Now, you have to sign up for an account where you can read it online. To download it, it's, it's $16, but uh, you can read it on the screen. Uh, and that is contained in 
uh, Western Folklore in 1963, uh, which is a, a short review, a two-page review of the book. If you're interested, just do a Google search for that and you'll be able to read that. I was supposed to incorporate that into tonight's episode, but I got so uh, carried away with reading the actual book itself, which is, as I say, uh, uh, I just want to restate it just in case you weren't aware of it, is a, a, a really, really wonderful uh, uh, volume. Uh, priceless, I would say, actually. So thanks and good night, everyone. Look after yourselves. And make sure to keep washing your hands and using hand sanitizer, socially distance and all that. Uh, masks are very important. Make sure that the mask covers your nose and your mouth. And remember that the nose is also connected to the lungs as well as the mouth. So it's no point in going around like that if your nose is still sticking out. And also don't forget the cough and sneeze etiquette into the crook of your elbow to, to prevent your, your, your germs or your, your vi virus uh, from spreading. If you have it, and please God, you don't have it. Um, look after yourselves. Uh, it only remains for me to say, in English and in Irish, uh, Slonga Fool, bye for now. Kolosov, sound sleep. Although in, in Australia, I'm sure, and in, in the States, it's not quite time for sleep yet. Uh, uh, Slonga Fool, Kolosov, Ikawa, good night. And of course, Tog Gubbogay, take it easy. I'm Anthony Murphy. This has been uh, Book Talk, and I'll see you for the next one. Don't know when, but it'll be soon. Take it easy. <laughs>